Come, Holy Spirit, and fill the hearts of your faithful people with the power of your word. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Good afternoon. It is such an extraordinary joy for me to be here with all of you and see so many people who I've known and loved for so many years. It's also a particular joy anytime you see a great priest who is beautifully matched with a great parish, which is what's going on here, and I couldn't be happier. And in addition to that, I have to say, because this is a diocese that I know and love from all the years that I spent as your close next door neighbor, it gives me just as much joy to see a bishop provisional and a diocese as beautifully matched. And I'm so grateful to your bishop for her extraordinary welcome to me. I'm basically the bishop equivalent of a toddler. And so I have already, in my short time, learned a ton from Bishop Bruce. She's been uh, kinder and more patient with me than I probably deserve. And I look forward to uh, continuing to learn from her uh, in the years to come. It's great to be with you. Uh, so just up the street from Trinity Cathedral in downtown Omaha, there is a building that looks like a flying saucer shot right out of a 60s sci-fi flick and crash landed on its side, wedged halfway into the concrete at 19th and Dodge. It is a super weird building. <laughs> and it has housed a number of now long forgotten things over the years. But currently, it is home to a really remarkable community called the Bike Union, which is a nonprofit coffee shop that also repairs and sells bicycles. Its mission, the basic idea, is to hire young people who are aging out of the foster care system, people who have experienced years worth of almost unimaginable challenge and trauma, who are still not even 18 years old. And the bike union hires them to both surround them with a loving, supporting community and give them some concrete skills, both on the retail coffee shop side and on the bicycle repair side of their operation. It's an amazing place that's led by truly amazing people. When your new rector joined the staff of our cathedral in 2017, he quietly but quickly befriended the folks at the bike meeting. So he started to drag me over there for meetings and we spent more and more time there. Eventually we started a tradition of having monthly lunches with the staff of the bike union, where we discovered the joys and challenges of leading two very different communities who are also remarkably similar. A few of the young adults from the bike union joined the cathedral, but most did not. But nevertheless, it became crystal clear that largely because of Stephen's leadership, the bike union became a part of the cathedral community in a very real way. Partners in the neighborhood committing to witnessing to God's coming kingdom of peace in that place. It was an extraordinary piece of leadership that Stephen undertook. So it did not surprise me to learn that Stephen chose that gospel lesson from Luke 10 for today's gospel lesson. Jesus' commission to the 70 to basically go out and join up with whatever God is already doing out in the neighborhood is how Stephen has always approached his ministry. And I know because I've known him since he was 17 years old. <laughs> and as those of you here who have known me for the better part of two decades will know, I believe this passage from Luke 10 is particularly critical for this moment that we've been given together, and particularly instructive for how you all, as rector and parish, might be together in the season that is just emerging. So it's a passage that I would encourage you to spend a lot of time with together as you come to know one another better and begin your ministry in the mon coming months and years. And for tonight, there are at least three ways that I can think of that Luke 10 
can inform how this community can enter into this new season. First, get out. I mean, literally, get out of here. Jesus does not send the 70, shockingly enough, to recruit new members to join the church. He sends them out to point to the places where the kingdom of God is already showing up in the real world, just like Stephen did with the Viking. People, it turns out, will not sign up with Jesus in order to help us grow or preserve our institution. They will sign up with Jesus because of the way they see us looking and acting like Jesus in how we show up in the world. I got a great tour of St. Paul's when I arrived here yesterday afternoon, and it's clear to me from everything Stephen reported about you that you're already doing this in a lot of wonderful ways as a congregation, and your job in the years to come will, to, will be to do more and more of what you've already begun. I recently heard a bishop from another part of the world say, if we make disciples, there will always be a church. But if we build the church, there will not always be disciples. If we make disciples, there will always be a church. But if we build the church, there will not always be disciples. Across my whole ministry, I have watched and I have been deeply complicit in our tendency as the church to fixate on how we hold on to what we have, how we return to what we think we once were, or how we fix our inherited forms. When in reality, the only thing we desperately need is to so firmly tether each other's hearts to the living God that we announce with every breath and every fiber of our being God's perfect reign of peace. So use this place to ground your hearts in the living God and get out. And when we get out, time to leave our baggage behind. I mean, one really crazy thing about this story that's the exact opposite of how we normally think about ourselves is that Jesus doesn't commission the 70 to go out and provide really great hospitality to people and throw wonderful parties and to do all those things that we love to do. He throws them out to depend entirely on the hospitality of others. And if you've been paying attention to the Bible, that is like classic God stuff. <laughs> the whole arc of Scripture, the whole story of Scripture starts with God coming to our original ancestors in the faith, Abraham and Sarah, calling them without any warning to leave everything behind, to set out for a destination they do not know and cannot see, with nothing to rely on but the outrageous promise of God. And that pattern is repeated over and over and over throughout the whole course of Scripture. As the world and the church continue to shift and change around us, our core work together is to learn again what it feels like to live our life together relying on nothing but the outrageous promises of God. Instead of relying on all the tricks and stuff that we use to keep ourselves safe. And the thing about it is we've all more than learned at this point that a lot of the baggage we've been carrying around in our churches we acquired in decades past by aligning ourselves with the forces of empire 
and going along for the ride as the church from coast to coast amassed immeasurable wealth. First, from the labor of enslaved Africans and the decimation of indigenous cultures. And then we held on to all that wealth by, at the best, turning a blind eye as we redlined the neighborhoods around our churches to keep their descendants away. Instead of hanging out with the dispossessed and the pushed aside, which are the places where Jesus always hangs out. So it turns out, a lot of the baggage we've been carrying around in our churches was rotten with a racist legacy that it's long past due to set down anyway. I think the key question for you all at St. Paul's to continue asking in the years to come is what baggage are you being invited to leave behind? And what do you need to carry forward? And then most importantly, go together. Jesus sent the disciples out in pairs because the Christian life is always a shared life. We aren't just a group of people who happen to occupy the same space for a couple of hours on a Sunday morning. But our lives belong to one another in a very real way. And I have to say, in my now many years as a pastor, I have seen at every turn and in every context that the universally shared sickness of our time is a deep and aching loneliness. The topography of our world, you're all more than aware, is a fractured web of fault lines that tear people from one another. God's work in the world always looks like filling in the gaps, breaking down walls, crashing through barriers, and forming beloved community across all those angry and divided factions. We are, every one of us, if we're honest, always desperately trying to save ourselves by winning, by acquiring, by possessing. And the heart of the gospel that we're confronted with every single day is that we can only be saved by love. We can only finally be saved by giving it all away. That starts by how we learn to love one another in spaces like this. And how we learn to travel. I have had the immense gift of traveling as a pair with your new rector. And I can tell you there is not any other person anywhere that I would rather have as a companion on the way. There is no one who I have met or who I have worked with who can form connections of love across lines of difference better than Stephen. I've seen him do it at the bike union, I've seen him do it with, say, the more challenging to love members of the congregation that we shared. <laughs> I've seen him do it with his clergy colleagues, and he's certainly done it with me personally. There is no one better than who you've called to lead you and be with you in this moment. The road ahead for us now, and the road ahead for us in every moment, and season is always unknown and uncertain. But the good news is that God is faithful. And if God has not given up on all of us yet, I don't know about you all, I don't know you that well, but if God hasn't given up on me, I couldn't possibly have screwed it up any worse. So if God has not given up yet, it's unlikely that God's going to give up on us in the years to come. So the good news is that God is faithful, and what we are celebrating today is the fact that we have been given the inestimable gift of each other. I'm so deeply grateful for you, Stephen, for the inestimable gift of having walked with you into at least a few of the places where Jesus has sent us. 
And I'm so grateful and hopeful for all of you here at St. Paul's as you embark together on this part of the journey. As the Apostle Paul reminds us tonight, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Jesus Christ as the chief cornerstone. So get out. Leave the baggage behind. And go together. As you extend the embrace of this magnificent household to God's whole broken, hurting, lonely world. Until God's perfect kingdom of peace comes. <laughs>